connected up. I got to stop. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, I'm here to talk about managing in tough times. Um, it's um, when I wrote the title and decided to talk about it. Uh, it's it's a wide enough subject you can drive a bus through it. Um, so let's start with talking about what is tough times. And in the business sense, uh, tough times mean different things at different times. A uh, few years back when the economy started to go south and eventually the bottom fell out, there was tough times all around uh, for most businesses. Sometimes tough times are driven by market realities, competition. You perhaps have a new co competitor who is trying to buy market share, and you have to deal with it, and your profits are starting to shrink. Uh, sometimes tough times are created by not having a sharp enough business plan, uh, and pushing ahead without validating them, especially in the early days of the business. So tough times mean different things in different types of business or different life cycles of the business. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the tricks that help get through tough times. Um, I, at one point in my career, I used to run a business um, that produced all the security materials that go into ID cards and passports issued by governments. So when the recession came, I was sitting there, fanned up and happy, going, this is a recession-proof business. You still need driver's licenses, you need ID cards. Uh, so where's my business is not going to get hurt? You still have to issue these documents. Uh, I had a, a colleague who ran the commercial side of the business that dealt with anti counterfeiting and brand protection, and he was hurting real bad. Well, little did I know what reality turned out to be. Uh, governments are actually smarter than you think. Even though they need to issue driver's licenses, let's take that as an example. What they decided to do was, they decided to squeeze their vendors and say, I'm going to extend your contract, I'm not going to go out to a new bid or do any of those crazy things to these tough times, but you're going to have to give me upgrades at the same price. So essentially my costs went up to protect the business because I didn't want to lose market share. And suddenly I had to deal with a very different business reality. I wasn't prepared for that. So the recession-proof business that I thought was going to just kind of chug along to the recession didn't. Suddenly I had to deal with having the same revenue but much higher costs. I had to scramble to figure out how to deal with it because my boss wanted essentially a certain amount of cash at the end of each quarter. And I had to deliver that. So what the, the lesson here is, I don't think in today's real business world there is any good times left anymore. Every minute when you think you're, going, you're managing or running a business in the good times, you're falling behind. Somebody else is engaging with you. You have to run a business as if you're in tough times all the time. And if you have that mindset, it will help you get through a lot of craziness and prepare better. You'll be much more agile when you actually hit turbulence. Some of my colleagues argue with me and say that, well, you never had any downtime. You never had time to retool or give people rest. And the simple answer is you don't get the walk. So we've got to focus on actually preparing to fight. And and deal with all the things that you need to do to manage in tough times. What's the first thing you need to do when you're managing tough times? What, what, you, what are you forced to do? You're forced to focus, you're forced to think differently. Because what you want to do is survive. That's the first instinct that kicks in. You have to survive. And so to survive, you have to think differently, and that leads to simplicity. You have to make things really simple, do a few things, and execute them flawlessly. If you don't, the rest doesn't matter. And so in business, thinking simply 
uh, is, is tough. We have been taught in a business culture and a business world, especially those of us who lived in the corporate world for years, that you make a long list of your goals and you set the most important ones, the top few, and then the next set, and then the next set. Uh, the different thinking, the challenge you face in tough times is you're very likely to have one goal. And that's what forces you to think differently. Uh, there's a very interesting book written by a fellow called Ken Sabo. Uh, Ken used to be the creative director at the ad agency that worked for Steve Jobs at Next and then at Apple, when Steve came back to Apple. Um, the book is not, there are many books that talk about how good or how crazy or how much of a terror uh, Steve Jobs was. This is Ken's story about his interactions with Steve and with Apple. The book's called Insanely Simple, The Passion That Fuels Success at Apple. Okay, uh, so, um, so in this book, uh, what you see is how different interactions Ken had with Steve was from interactions he had with Dell, with IBM, with Intel, he even worked for, but with Nike for a while as their creative director. Uh, it's a good read. It's a very thin book. It's simply, it's, it's an easy read. If you haven't read it, please do. I encourage you to read it because it, it talks a lot. There's some fun, through the fun that in his interactions, there's some neat lessons to be learned. You have a few aha moments as you read this book. Human beings are a funny lot. Well, we're kind of funny. If you catch somebody and discuss one idea with them, they'll nod their head. If you catch them and talk about five ideas, they're going to scratch their head and very likely forget all five. That's how we are wired. And this leads you to the purpose of simple one purpose, a very simple purpose. In Ken Siegel's book, he talks about the simple stick. The simple stick is what euphemistically Apple and what is called the weapon that Steve Jobs really did. And it would show up in meetings almost unpredictably, and it was a violent tirade. Uh, but when you triggered his angst, his ire, because you hadn't simplified it, you got beat by the simple and it happened pretty regularly at that. Uh, read the book. I won't spoil your thought about it. But the sim but what they did was built a DNA where they asked themselves, am I going to get beat by the simple stick before they went into a meeting? <laughs> so they, they were prepared for that. Uh, simplifying stuff leads to focus. These two words, simple and focus, are kind of tied together. Simplifying, simplifying things gives you focus. If you focus, amazingly, things become quite simple. Uh, so getting the focus right is, and completely getting to the core of what you want to accomplish is perhaps the most important thing you're going to do uh, ever in running a business. If you can't tell, you hear a lot about 30 second elevator speeches. Uh, it needs to be a five second. If you can't express what you want to do in five to ten seconds, you're very likely are trying to do too much. And it's uh, it's just the way it is. Um, early in my career, um, I failed at simplicity and focus. Uh, I started my career as a research engineer at the labs. I had a guy in Montana, um, the best mm -hmm. research lab in the world at that time. Um, I could do anything I wanted. There were 32,000 of us in the labs at that time. Half of us had doctorates. And the main thing was, you only used first names, and everybody was a peer. Uh, people whose books I had read didn't demand respect. We were colleagues. We could ask each other questions and collaborate with each other. Here's my lack of focus. I was finishing up my doctorate, and I did, uh, I presented an amazing paper at a conference and the guys at the labs hired me before I finished. 
They said, come on over, work, finish, come here. You're almost done, you're gonna just have to write. Well, I got involved with so many interesting things in the labs. I met with the patient. Three years, 60 credits beyond my master's later, I still don't have it. I lost my focus. Um, obviously, it was important to me because otherwise I should have left after my master's and gone on to work. I did. But I got excited about all kinds of things. And if you look at me as a corporation, I failed to focus. I failed to accomplish pretty important goals. The only man who beat me with the simple stick was my dad. And forever, George, you need to finish. <laughs> What's the matter with you? Uh, for about 25 years, I carried all the, I did some work on the very esoteric image modeling stuff. Really bad man. And I carried around all my papers in a box for about 25 years. Finally, my wife said, you need to let it go, because you're never going to finish it. And so it's gone. That part is gone, but I personally learned to focus from that. Another personal story. Uh, after leaving the labs, uh, I went on to run my, uh, that's my first general management job. I ran a division at Tektronix, a uh, large electronic corporation in Northern California. And they had built this company because this division was started by their chief technology officer. They had some neat new technology, which they were trying to target products, and they did, uh, but they couldn't make any money. And you don't run a business that doesn't make money at that point, as my old boss used to say, it's a hobby, it's not a business. And so I was hired to come in and see if I could fix the problem. And having a research background, they thought perhaps I could really figure it out. Well, it, it was an interesting challenge. Now, because I walked in it, here was a division where most of the people were engineers, and they had been having fun for a long time. And they were absolutely flabbergasted that I took two thirds of the products and the project off the table. They said, no, we're going to do three things, and we're going to do it really well. Let's go find out from the customers which three things we're going to do. And it really, really bothered me. They never expected this guy from the labs, this research guy, to come in and do this. Well, guess what? Um, in two years, we were profitable, and the business did just. Here again, we had to simplify from 15, 20 products to three products, make it well, and figure out what customers really want. So, read and say, be simple. Uh, simplify your goals. Uh, simplify, as you start to sit down and stare at your goals and simplify them, you'll find it's harder than it looks. And then it is. And if it's not that hard, you very likely haven't thought. The next element of managing in tough times is the customer. You have got to have a passion for the customer. Every time I've worked with large corporations and we hit the rocks, the first thing the CFO says, cut discretionary expenses, cut travel. And you go, no, that's the dumbest thing you can do because you're not going to go talk to the customer. Talking to the customer is perhaps the most important thing you can do at any time especially in tough times, because you need the customer, you exist for the customer, and they kind of pay attention to who's still coming around in tough times, because everybody else has got their traffic up. They don't do conference calls, they don't show up. Customers will tell you how to focus, what to focus on, simplifying your life. They may not know what product they need. You may be building a game changer, but if you listen carefully, you will get a sense for how you're going to change their life. Because that's what you want to accomplish at the end of the day. And customers can be incredibly forgiving if you service the heck out of them. Again, a little personal story. A few years back, uh, I used to be part of a little startup company that did an IPO and raised a boatload of money. This was in the early days of the internet. We tried to raise 20 million, we raised 82, and we finally said no more. We don't want to any more money. Please stop. <laughs> we don't know what to do with it. And unlike most of our peer companies, 
He didn't burn it on nice marketing, fancy offices, all that good stuff. He saved it in the bank. So a bunch of us old brick and mortar guys who kind of knew not to do things like that. And when the bubble burst, we still had 62 million in the bank, which was amazing, given our peer group and where they stood. So we went to sp and spent a chunk of, money, of that money buying a piece of Polaroid, which was in bankruptcy at that time. And it was a good strategic fit because we could apply our technology in their product lines very quickly. So we had this opportunity, but boy did I get in trouble. I got to go around this division of Polaroid, so I went I moved to Boston. This business was the Polaroid business that produced driver's licenses. Okay. By the time I left, uh, we had exceeded over 80% of market share. It, it was a big part of the business. Started off with Polaroid pictures and then moved to digital. I had a customer uh, in May, the state of May. Uh, the Secretary of State wrote us a letter saying that they had been lied to so badly by their um, by the previous Polaroid administration, they would not meet with anybody from the previous management team ever again. And if we set foot in the state, they naturally arrest us. I actually still say, I have that written letter. I've never seen a letter like that from a government um, official threatening a whole company and saying clearly that you lie on these instances. But here's the bottom line. I hiked up to Augusta, Maine, which is quite a ways from Boston. I used to do that every month. Met with them, listened to them, let them vent, but more than anything, serviced them to the point where they extended my contract. They gave uh, us good references, and they were one, eventually one of our best supporters. Give an example of where, if you take the time to go sit and listen to the customer, Maine had a unique geography, big state, very sparse population. Driver's licenses, you don't have lots of offices, so you've got to service them differently. Nobody ever took care of that. That was the problem. So we sat and listened to them and figured out what they needed. We saw, and guess what? It's very useful in lots of states, in the mountain states in the north, Wisconsin, places like that. So we solved a problem, built a model, and the customer told us what to do. The third element of managing in firms is your core team. You're not going to be able to manage yourself. If you're an entrepreneur, you're going to need a partner or a couple of partners. If you're running a business, you're going to need a core team. Again, our corporate background, we've been taught for years uh, to hire people in a certain way. We write a job description. Uh, we match the requirements, the background, and the job description to the best people. We interview them, we hire them. That's what we've been taught. That's the right way to hire. HR people will do that day after day after day. Here's the problem. You're not sure you're getting the right person. Hiring is changing. You want, and there is uh, a school of thought that now says you hire for attitude. What the heck is that, hire for attitude? Uh, let me give you an example. Southwest Airlines. One of their core values, the, simple, the sim simplification, is to have fun. With their customers. If you've flown Southwest and you've listened to some of their announcements, they, they're fun, they're interesting, and they encourage that. But you didn't know they kind of asked their pilots to do the same thing as well. Uh, there's now a, a lot of literature that talks about brown pants. Uh, you have to hire your brown pants. And let me explain what brown pants mean. Actually, brown shorts. Uh, Southwest was doing an interview for pilots, and typical pilots were fine. Mid-30s, dark suit, shiny polish shoes, black socks, very, very formal, very serious, serious mostly male class. Okay. So we got in this room, and the HR person said, uh, I know you guys are very well dressed and set up and outfitted for this interview, but we're going to do something a little different. We want you to be comfortable. We want you guys to take off your dress slacks and put on these brown shorts that I have. Now, I'm sure three quarters of the people who were in the interview room went, find some other gentleman to act like an idiot. But that was Southwest's way of checking to see who was comfortable in 
a very different environment. That was their way of hiring for attitude. That's how they felt. And they still do that. So hence, you want to find your ground. Hence, you want to find the people who will fit, who have an attitude. And there's one other thing. And this is, this is strange, but it's true. You want to find people so you can coach. If you find the right people with attitude, you're going to need to teach them your business and you need to coach them. For that, you need people who will take coaching. A lot of people don't. There's not tests to measure coachability index. God knows what they'll come up with next. Um, but you want to hire a team, a core team that has an attitude and that will go to the mat for you every day. Because you don't need to break. You're managing as if you're at the wall every day. There is no break. Attrition will happen. If you have a very tight team, other people will pick up the slack while you replenish people into the team, bring new people into the team. So hiring the right team and empowering them is something that you absolutely have to do. You can't do it yourself. Lots of CEOs try, lots of entrepreneurs try. You need a team to go work in. You can't do it yourself. And if you try to do everybody's job, you're going to fail. You don't need them. I'll finish up with, my friend Doug's telling me I'm running out of time. I'm going to finish up with a little story again about myself uh, and an experience I had which kind of pulled it all together. Uh, remember I talked about when I started this company that I ran, uh, this division of the business that I ran, which did government work, Fast Force ID company. The recession-proof business, it really wasn't recession-proof. Uh, when I finally re realized mine wasn't recession proof, and my colleague's business definitely wasn't recession proof, we had to sit down with our CEO and go, we're screwed. We had a problem. <laughs> <laughs> because I can't hold up the rest of the company. I got problems of my own. And after a lot of soul searching, we came up with two logical options. Now, the first one, which is what everybody does, go lay out people. In that business, and in any business, hiring people, committed people, good people who will stay with the company is difficult at any time. In hard times, it's more difficult than all the effort put into training that walks out the door. And when the economy comes back, you have to do that investment all the way. You can't crank up and get ahead of your competition because you're not ready. So we came up with a really crazy idea. Three of us, we sat down and said, okay, let's try this. The management team is going, instead of laying off people, the management team is going to take a pay cut. And pretty significant one. And the higher up you are, the more you make, the bigger your pay cut. Uh, but that's, again, conventional sense. People do that all the time. We did something a little different. We went back to the board and said, we'll do this, but you have to create a program where if you meet specific objectives, you can not only give us our money back, you actually make more back. We're, we're investing in the company. And in tough times, the only measure that matters is cash. We can manage the cash. So everybody was tied. Instead of lots of metrics and measurements, it was tied to cash management. The whole company was measured in cash. And amazingly, we made this a voluntary program. Amazingly, every last management team member bought into it. Lots of consultations from spouses. I know my wife had lots of questions. What are you doing? Are you crazy? That kind of stuff. Uh, how are you going to do these things? But I'll tell you something. At the end of the year, as the recession was winding down, we beat every measure in that plan. And we got, gave back three times the money people put at risk. And it was fun to watch these guys, a manufacturing engineer, stepping up and telling a sales guy, I'll go with you on a sales call. Let's close this deal. Amazing thing. Everybody was focused on saving a buck. That was cash management. Amazing things happen when you have good people with attitude. You empower them and you have a simple thing. Magic.